Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Eric Green, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I want to welcome all of you to this annual lectureship, the Jeffrey M. Trent Lecture in Cancer Research. Um, I'm going to give a general um, introduction to this lecture series, and uh, then I'll turn over the podium uh, to our Deputy Scientific Director, Paul Liu, who will introduce today's speaker. But I have the pleasure of saying a few remarks about um, this lectureship and uh, the person that this lectureship is named after, and that's Jeff Trent. Um, the story goes as follows. If you go back in time, um, uh, the intramural program of NHGRI has not been around forever by any means. Um, and in fact, 23 years ago, it really only existed as an idea. Uh, but uh, Jeff Trent was brought here to essentially build the intramural program. Um, he was brought here uh, in, in jointly when Francis Collins came here as the direct, then the director of the institute and was asked to create an intramural program. Um, that is not an easy thing to do when it doesn't exist at all. He had to start from scratch, um, recruiting a number of people, getting space, getting staff, getting everything organized. And uh, what I would say is he did it in a spectacular way. I had the good fortune of joining the effort not in 1993 when Jeff arrived and some of the first investigators arrived, some of which are actually in the audience. Um, I arrived a year later. Um, but was very fortunate to be able to join what was already a, a growing and incredibly exciting place uh, to be an investigator uh, doing research in. And a lot of the credit for that really goes to Jeff. He uh, was able to not only recruit good people, but to put together an organization and a style for our intramural program that I think has uh, served it extremely well as it has progressed through the years, now actually in its third uh, director of the intramural program. Um, so Jeff was, uh, was the scientific director um, from about 1993 to 2002. Um, at that time, he departed and, and became uh, the founding president and research director of the Translational Genomics Research Institute, in, or TGen, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, um, which, and then had a similar opportunity to build Science Spectacular out there in the desert. Um, and I'll leave it to others to talk, and you could read more about TGen, and there are some great things uh, that have happened since then. What I would say is uh, I feel very fortunate to have watched Jeff lead the intramural program, and I think I learned a lot, as did all of us who are uh, research investigators in the intramural program uh, during his stewardship of the program. Um, and then I was uh, fortunate enough to then be appointed to be his successor, uh, and I served as the scientific director of NHGRI from 2002 um, until just about six years ago uh, when I got this new job. But what I would say is one of the very first things I did uh, back in 2003, shortly after becoming the scientific director, was to honor what I thought was a very valuable legacy that Jeff had left behind in terms of his mark on the intramural program and being the founding scientific director. And we established uh, this lectureship in his name. And so just to, and, and meanwhile, we've had no problem uh, getting truly outstanding scientists to be honored by coming and giving the annual Jeff Trent lecture. Just to give you a flavor, uh, people like Janet Rowley, Lee Hartwell, Harold Varmus, Mike Stratton, Eric Lander, Brian Drucker, Carol Greider, Charles Sawyer, Chris Amos, Bert Vogelstein, Stephen Chanick. Among that list are three Nobel laureates and uh, multiple members of the National Academy. Needless to say, um, th I think people in the community also have deep admiration for Jeff and for what he did here and are absolutely willing to say yes when we invite them um, to give this annual lecture. And sometimes what's also great about this lecture is that it gives an excuse uh, for Jeff to come back and visit us for a day um, and spend time with us. And indeed, this is one of the years he's been able to do it. So Jeff is here along with his wife, Dee, and a pleasure to have you here, and thanks so much. So that's the history of the lectureship, and uh, I'd like to turn this over to our Deputy Scientific Director, Paul Liu, who's going to have the pleasure of introducing uh, this year's Jeff Trent Lecture. Paul. It is truly my great pleasure to introduce uh, John Carpton. Uh, first, I want to say uh, Dan Kessner, who is the current scientific director, sent his regret that he couldn't be here. He's actually in Australia, you know, this is 13 hours ahead of us, and uh, so um, he couldn't uh, give this intro introduction. Um, John um, probably don't need introduction to many in this audience, since he was one of the first recruit by Jeff uh, into his lab as a postdoc fellow and then a senior uh, research uh, fellow um, when uh, John graduated from Ohio State University uh, with his PhD. And he came here 
uh, working in the Jeff lab for about six years, and then he became a tenure track in independent investigator uh, in 2000. Then he left NIH, went to TGM, became the professor at the division of um, uh, translational genomics and uh, the division of integrated cancer genomics, and uh, also became the deputy director of basic research in 2012. Only recently, he moved to the University of South California, um, become the chair of the Department of Translation Genomics, and also newly formed Institute of Translational Genomics. Um, John has made many seminal contributions to cancer genetics and genomics, and he has published over 150 papers, and many of them highly cited. I just checked this morning, one of them was cited more than 1,000 times, and uh, which is quite impressive. He has several patents, and uh, he's a very busy person. So, uh, he's on so many committees, and uh, he served the NICE, you know, on study sections and other, you know, advisory roles, and uh, it's really great pleasure to welcome back. Thank you, John. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Paul. Uh, Eric, I, di I didn't know about that list. That's kind of scary. Um, well, um, well, I think I can say honestly that, you know, no matter how, uh, how far my career goes, I don't think there could be a more uh, 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 honorable place that I'd like to be than right here, standing at the podium, uh, giving this lecture today. I have so many friends and colleagues in the audience, and a number of them who've, you know, been incredibly supportive and play, have played uh, very critical roles uh, in some of the scientific uh, discoveries that we've made through the years. Um, and I won't call names because I don't want to miss any names, uh, but to all of you, I just want to say thanks again. Uh, it's been a fun ride. Uh, I remember one of the Harry Potter movies, they were driving through London in a double-decker bus and it was going all over the place and the driver said in a very uh, uh, Caribbean way, it's going to be a bumpy ride. And I wish people had told me that before I started, um, because it has been a bumpy ride, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, had the opportunity, again, to work with a lot of amazing scientists, and just want to say before I get started that um, I am I'm presenting this, this on behalf of a lot of great people. Um, I don't take singular credit for a single thing that I've done. Uh, it's just not my approach to getting things done. I've, I was sort of raised in the... Uh, culture of team science by folks like Jeff Trent and Francis Collins uh, by bringing together, you know, enough uh, 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 smart brains, you can get a lot of incredible things done. And so through my career, I've done a lot of work both on the germline genetic side, the cell biology side, as well as cancer uh, genomics and tumor profiling. And I could talk about a lot of different things, uh, but I really want to, you know, bring to bear some of the work that we've done and uh, uh, some of the concepts that we're seeing uh, uh, moving forward, uh, and how aspects of population and tumor heterogeneity uh, 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 have significant impacts on cancer genome science and, uh, and clinical phenotypes, and I'm going to spend a lot of time, again, in cancer uh, and in the new uh, uh, medical paradigm of, of precision medicine, uh, here again focusing mainly on the work we've done in, in, uh, in, in the oncology space. Uh, and I affiliate both with uh, the University of Southern California uh, uh, as chair of the new Department of Translational Genomics, but also maintain a, a, a relatively strong uh, uh, relationship with, with Jeff and the team at TGen as an adjunct faculty member there. Uh, I know it's not ACR, but I always like to do this, and, you know, there are some financial disclosures. I'm one of the founders of Ashine Analytics, uh, which is a clinical sequencing laboratory, uh, and I'll discuss off-label use of uh, several uh, uh, um, FDA-approved drugs, including panatinib, zopinib, erlotinib, and pertuzumab. Um, so getting right to business, um, I think, you know, the, my uh, pr presentation will be sort of sectioned uh, uh, based on, you know, uh, looking at uh, historical studies uh, and some of the work that we've done and looking at population uh, heterogeneity uh, 
uh, as a function of cancer genome science, and then I'll go into some aspects of tumor heterogeneity and how that can uh, influence our interpretation of, of data that's being used both in the research space as well as uh, in the clinical space through precision medicine. So, and thinking about population heterogeneity, uh, I think we, we want to focus on uh, phenotypic differences that we see and looking at sort of uh, global uh, cancer statistics for uh, incidence and death rates in men and women and seeing the common cast of characters uh, for uh, incidence being prostate and breast and uh, lung and colon and, and some other uh, uh, diseases that we don't look at very commonly because they're a little bit more rare like uh, 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 bile duct cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, and then looking at uh, death, death rates, again, lung cancer still being a very significant uh, 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 con uh, contributor to cancer deaths, even with uh, the advancements in uh, smoking cessation and uh, prostate and breast, of course, and colon. And then we start to see tumor types that actually come off as being kind of rare, like pancreatic, and again, this bile duct cancer. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we're doing uh, in that space. But then when we focus on and, and look at cancer uh, uh, incidents and death rates in African Americans or blacks, we, we see a similar uh, picture where we see prostate and breast and uh, colon, but then we see things like bile duct cancer actually float up a little uh, higher to the, the top of the list and looking at... <clears throat> And looking at men, uh, uh, African American men, and it actually happens to be the fourth most most common cancer in that group. Uh, it's not that far down the female list either. But uh, again, just you know, thinking about you know, there are some commonalities when we look broadly at cancer statistics, but there are some differences uh, in these things that we tend to look at as cancer health disparities, where diseases like prostate cancer are about twice as commonly diagnosed in African-American men. And although breast cancer is more common in, in white women, uh, the cancers uh, can be uh, detected a bit earlier and have more aggressive biologies in, in African-American women. And I'll start off, you know, talking about, you know, the, these concepts of race and ancestry. And I see Vince Bonham, uh, at least he was, is sitting in the, in the, in the, in the uh, audience there. And uh, Vince has really spearheaded a ton of work uh, in really trying to educate the population on these differences and that these two things are not necessarily the same. And there's a really complex interplay between the two of these things where race is being a social construct and, uh, um, and, and, and I think Francis has called it a proxy of sorts uh, uh, and, and is, is much more related to social and societal uh, 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 related uh, factors where we have, and then we have uh, ancestry, which is real genetics and biology and is associated with uh, ancestral uh, uh, genetic material that's passed through individuals. And again, there's an interplay here where undoubtedly, you know, individuals of, you know, that have common ancestral backgrounds can definitely have societal clustering uh, uh, and, and higher in interactions and, uh, and can have more ethnic similarities. Uh, but then you can also look at ancestry. We can have individuals who have very similar uh, genetic ancestries, but have very different cultural uh, uh, lifestyles. And, and so these two things, there's a complex interplay there, but I really want to focus on, you know, how we look at these things and, 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 and primarily, again, thinking about genetic ancestry and principal components analyses and uh, individuals like Rick Kittles and others have really spearheaded a lot of this work and understanding that there are very specific genetic alleles that have very high, uh, very different frequencies in, in uh, different populations. Uh, a, a gene, uh, an allele in Duffy is, is uh, one of the more um, uh, sort of the poster child of, of these ancestry informative markers that, that, that we, we can use to actually bend individuals based on true genetic ancestry rather than sort of racial, cultural, or, or ethnic similarities. But again, undoubtedly, there's an interplay here between race and, and society and, and constructs and ancestry uh, and how they uh, impact phenotypes and diseases. Uh, and you know, several questions can be asked. Can genetic ancestry be associated with biology and phenotype? And the answer is undoubtedly an, uh, an astounding yes. I think we can think of a, uh, a condition or disease such as uh, sickle cell anemia, and I, and I, you know, take a moment to, you know, make the fact that we have to be careful also about characterizing phenotypes. Everything's not a disease. Some things are just conditions, uh, and it's a condition of an individual in one environment versus another one. Uh, again, sickle cell is a perfect example where individuals uh, who live in a highly uh, malaria-infested area carrying that allele actually have, uh, uh, it's beneficial. 
because those individuals can live to uh, ages to reproduce, uh, individuals who have a normal allele will be affected and can die from uh, malarial infections. You take those individuals out of that environment, put them in an, an environment where there's no malaria, all of a sudden they, they have a disease. So we have to be careful about that. And salt retention and hyperten uh, uh, hypertension is another uh, classic uh, example. And then we have like diseases and, and truly uh, deleterious uh, uh, phenotypes like cancer. Um, that can be definitely uh, a related more to genetic ancestry rather than race. And, but race, of, of course, without a doubt, and I know there are social scientists in the audience, uh, I am not the biologist who believes that these differences we see in outcome uh, or health disparities are specifically linked to uh, biology. Some of these things are associated with, with uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, factors, such as poverty, access to health care, uh, environments, and some behaviors that might be associated with diets and, or lifestyles. And, and then this complex, again, this complex interplay between uh, genetic ancestry uh, and race. But I want to walk through a few examples where you know, we can start looking at uh, ancestry or race and how it can influence disease risk and ancestry or race and how it might uh, influence uh, disease outcomes. And the first example will be work that was done in lymphoma by a group out of the ACS where they published a paper looking at disparities in the adoption of, of the use of rituximab uh, in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma where uh, in the early 2000s it, it was shown that adding this anti-CD20 antibody rituximab uh, to CHOP therapy uh, significantly improved both complete responses and, and overall response uh, in, in patients with lymphoma. But they then went on to show that there was a disparity in the adoption and use uh, showing that uh, 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 individuals who were uh, African American which were less likely, much less likely to get uh, rituximab added to their chemotherapeutic regimen, uh, and then they were on, go, uh, able to go on and show that individuals who um, uh, uh, had insurance versus those who were uninsured were less likely or more likely to get um, uh, access to this uh, blockbuster drug. So in this case, one can actually almost say that there's really no genetic ancestry associated with this disparity in outcome. Uh, these disparities in outcome or, or uh, access to these drugs, it's purely access to care. Uh, and another example which I get really excited about is work that was done in pediatric leukemia. Uh, uh, June Yang and Mary Relling, the group out of St. Jude's, and this is to me one of the real strong um, uh, uh, studies that, that really sort of made a true link between ancestry uh, and biology in a disease. Uh, and I think it, it, it should uh, be always known as one of the, the first seminal examples of, of, of this. Um, so we know that uh, ALL, uh, 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 five-year uh, survival rates are really high. Most of these kids do, do pretty well, but not all of them do, and there are definitely some uh, ethnic or racial differences in survival and outcome uh, with poor, poor overall survival seen in out among African-American kids and kids of, at the time, let's, you know, we're, you know, the Hispanic ethnicity. Um, we can use various phrases, Latino, uh, compared to uh, European Americans or Asians. And so June performed a genome-wide association study on about 2,500 uh, kids who had been diagnosed with ALL. And it's important to know that the treatment regimen t tends to include uh, initial induction therapy, which can be quite intense, and then uh, con consolidation or intensification to really try to drive the cancer into uh, remission. And then after remission, there's then given maintenance. And during maintenance, in some cases, what they'll do is they'll do a real intense infusion for a month or two, and this is called delayed intensification uh, that occurs at the start of maintenance therapy, and this will be important uh, as I, as I uh, uh, talk about uh, summarizing the rest of the study. So he performed principal components analysis from AFI 500K data on these kids, and if you look at the, the kids, uh, the, the sort of genetic contribution, the individuals with the, the red, this is European genetic contribution. Uh, Africans are in gray, uh, the African chromosomal uh, uh, material or uh, uh, genetic um, uh, ancestry. Uh, green is Asian, and then the blue is Native American. And uh, this is where the analysis got really, really interesting. He was a actually able to show that kids that had greater than 10 percent Native American ancestry based on their PCA had a much higher probability of relapse after therapy. Um, and this is relapse after, uh, after uh, induction, I mean after uh, uh, maintenance. And so you can, you can look here and, and, and see even kids who self-reported as white but had greater than 10% Native American ancestry also had a much greater probability of relapse. 
And then when you looked at outcomes based on therapy, when you looked at kids who did not get delayed intensification uh, uh, during maintenance, there was a, a significant increase in probability, uh, especially when you looked at kids with greater than 10% Native American ancestry. But when you looked at the kids who all got a delayed intensification, you can almost completely eliminate the disparity. So if you have a kid who comes in greater than 10% Native American ancestry, then perhaps that child should always get delayed intensification as part of their, their maintenance therapy. So again, there's this real cool association between genetic ancestry and a clinical outcome, but through uh, a more of a socioeconomic uh, approach and making sure that they get the appropriate therapy, you can completely eliminate that disparity. So I think this is a great example um, of how we can think about ancestry and, and population uh, 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 heterogeneity and its influence on, on disease risk and outcome. And then I want to uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about a little bit about the work that we've done in, in multiple myeloma uh, in my lab and uh, in collaboration with you know scientists from from various institutions. I'll walk through that. So myeloma being a disease of plasma cells with a very well known uh, 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 molecular pathogenesis and uh, from normal B cell to monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or pre malignant. A B cell disease through full-blown myeloma with a, a primary uh, genetic lesion uh, being defined by uh, uh, translocations at the IgH locus on chromosome 14 uh, to a series of oncogenes and uh, uh, downstream progression uh, uh, events including deletion of chromosome 13 or th chromosome 13 monosomy, uh, somatic mutations in RAS, uh, RAS genes and FGFR and other secondary events such as amplification of, of CMYK. Um, it tends to be a disease of aging, meaning that uh, the median age of diagnosis is around 70, about 30,000 newly diagnosed cases, 10, about 10, 11,000 deaths uh, per year. Uh, we've seen this incredible development of blockbuster drugs, um, uh, particularly the immunomodulatory uh, inhibitors or, or IMIDs such as lenalidomide and proteasome inhibitors uh, such as bortezomib and, and more recently uh, carfilzomib. Uh, with a five-year over, overall survival rate, uh, before the, the use of these drugs was only about 37%, uh, and it's increased to almost 50% because of the development of these incredible drugs. Uh, but also of an, an importance is that multiple myeloma actually happens to represent one of the most significant uh, cancer health disparities. Uh, looking at incidence rates uh, in males, it actually has the second highest rate ratio, rate race ratio between African Americans and Europeans, uh, both in males and females. And in looking at death rates, uh, the rate ratio is also um, among the, the, the top uh, killers uh, for uh, both African American men and women. Uh, so it's been a very uh, uh, a, a disease of, of quite a bit of interest for, for my research program uh, where we've got some hypotheses uh, that we're trying to test, one being although mortality disparities um, have, have decreased on the outcome side, uh, there's a, still a consistent disparity in incidence rate. Uh, and, and that, along with this historical difference in mortality, could suggest a possible genetic role uh, or biological role, role for these disparities. Uh, and we've set out to determine if uh, somatic events in tumors uh, uh, that are associated, have been associated with poor outcome in myeloma through other studies might be enriched in tumors from African American patients. Uh, we had a large series of about 250 tumors that we profiled in collaboration with the Broad Institute. Uh, who performed uh, genome sequencing, uh, my lab did, and, and uh, in collaboration with Jeff, we did a bunch of work in uh, developing gene expression uh, uh, information and copy number uh, data from, from these tumors using array technologies. All the data is available publicly through a portal. Uh, within our, interestingly, interestingly, within our cohort, there are about uh, 15, uh, 16 African American patients, about 180 European American patients. And what we wanted to do was to look at these regions of the genome that had been previously associated with uh, poor outcome or high risk disease to see if there were any differences in the frequency of these events and tumors derived from African American and European American papers. And uh, Angie Baker, who's a staff scientist in my lab, uh, was the lead author on this paper. Uh, which was a seminal uh, study that was the first to report uh, biological and genomic uh, uh, analysis of tumors uh, from African American patients uh, in comparing uh, to tumors from European American patients. And just looking at the results of the copy number, I won't go through everything in, in detail, but one thing that jumped out at us was 1Q gain, which is uh, highly associated with 
a, a, a high-risk disease, actually happened to be more uh, frequent in tumors uh, from European American patients than African American patients. Uh, it reached statistical significance and after correction it went away, but it was still pretty close. Um, and that was an indication that, are we thinking about it the wrong way? Could African American patients actually have tumors that are more associated with favorable outcome? And if they got the right drugs, maybe they'd actually end up doing better. And looking at you know, some other, uh, um, uh, like uh, the Arkansas high-risk uh, gene expression profile, we didn't see much of a difference there. We looked at 14Q breakpoints. We also saw here that uh, tumors from European American patients were more likely to have breakpoints at 14Q than African American patients, again, suggesting that perhaps African American patients have tumors that are more associated with favorable outcome. Um, and in talking to lots of uh, 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 hematologists, oncologists who treat myeloma patients, they all tend to say that African American patients do better when they get the image and the, and the, and the proteasome inhibitors. So in this case, we believe that African Americans may have tumors that are more associated with favorable outcome, and if they get the appropriate drugs, then perhaps they might actually uh, do uh, as well uh, or better. But there's still this historical difference in incidence. Um, which could suggest that there might be an inherited uh, um, uh, uh, factor involved in a more frequent uh, um, uh, development of multiple myeloma in these patients. Uh, we've now since uh, begun to apply uh, deeper whole genome sequencing technologies to uh, analyzing these tumors and of course they're awesome because we can do very comprehensive uh, ge genomic interrogation uh, point mutations across the exome or genome, copy, make, we can deduce copy number changes, identify gross rearrangements, and if we have RNA, of course, we can do all sorts of cool uh, transcriptional analyses. And just uh, a few slides about the work we're doing, uh, another study through the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, which I think is, it could be a model for cancer genome science going forward. Uh, this is a longitudinal study. It's not taking it's not performing genomic analysis and taking a snapshot of a single sample from a single tumor. Single tumor. In this study, we're, we're actually recruiting patients at diagnosis pre-treatment, and we've recruited 1,000 patients. And we're profiling all of these tumors, uh, normal tumor pairs, uh, tumors have been enriched uh, for a whole genome, whole exome, and RNA sequencing. Uh, all of the patients will go on one of three treatment regimens, and then at relapse, we're collecting tumors and profiling there as well, so we can really get a, a sense of the natural history of these tumors uh, during the course of, of, of therapy. And this uh, study is really being driven by a really talented uh, scientist at TGen uh, named Jonathan Keats, who I share the, the PI uh, ship with, and uh, Winnie Liang, who runs the Collaborative Sequencing Center at TGen, and comparing this study to all of the other TCGA and large cancer genome studies, we've generated uh, uh, more data than all except the uh, uh, next-gen sequence data ex for all except the breast cancer studies, uh, and just looking at, you know, the, the distribution of RNA, exome, and whole genome, again, this being uh, compass and this being breast, so we've generated quite a bit of data for this project already, and this, these data will be made public available. Uh, one of the postdocs in my lab, Zarko Manoilovich, has, been, has taken this data and run MUTSIG analysis to look at um, the mutational status of myeloma tumors uh, and looking at the landscape. And again, we've published some papers previously on the, the, the somatic landscape of myeloma um, uh, in, in a smaller data set, and, but overall the mutation frequencies are pretty uh, similar and we know what the most commonly mutated genes are. But what this uh, study empowered us to do is to be able to look at uh, over 100 African-American tumors, uh, making it the largest study to date, and over 500, 600 or so tumors from uh, Euro European-American patients. And what we've now done, instead of just using self-identified race, we've begun to extract uh, genetic ancestry information from this. And so this was a principal components analysis done by Zarco, um, where we took uh, first anchored uh, uh, our, our PCA using the 1,000 genomes populations, focusing on the Yoruban of uh, Ibadan, Nigeria, uh, the African-American uh, population from Southwest, the CEF, uh, or the CEU from uh, Utah, the Mexican from LA, and the Hong Chinese. And so here are the different groups. Here's the Yoruban and the Brown, the CEF, the, the uh, Mexican from, from Los Angeles, in the Hong, and the African-Americans here, you can see this sort of distribution or continuum 
uh, uh, through uh, uh, sort of the, we know the admixture between African and European chromosomes. And then we can overlay our, our myeloma patients here in blue where we have our uh, uh, European uh, self-identified patients and those that self-identify as African American and then patients that kind of fall in between different areas of the principal components. And then begin to look at mutation differences based on the PCA, so African Americans that have higher degrees uh, 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 of African ancestry versus uh, those uh, uh, um, and more centrally distributed uh, in the continuum. Uh, and then look at the differences. And, and so this is just looking at you know, the, the genetic uh, alterations across a series of, of commonly mutated uh, genes. And some thing, interesting things have popped out, for instance, looking at you know, P53 mutations are much more common uh, in tumors from European American patients than from African -Amer American patients. And TP53 loss and mutations are significantly associated with poor outcome in myeloma. So again, lean, this, these data suggesting that African Americans might have tumors that uh, have, uh, are associated with more favorable outcome. And then all these mutations that are more common in tumors derived from, from uh, individuals with Afri uh, African ancestry uh, versus European ancestry. And some of the genes of interest we're looking at is patch D3, uh, uh, not well, well characterized gene, but with a very significant difference. And I think this group is really interesting because even though we have a lower number of African, uh, of tumors from uh, individuals with African uh, ancestry, we still see these significant differences. We've got almost over 600 tumors here. And so these frequencies should be pretty stable uh, uh, over time. So again, for the first time, really understanding somatic differences in tumors from individuals uh, based on, 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 on ancestry. And again, you know, looking at the uh, Zarco, looking at the pathways that might be more, more uh, differentially regulated uh, in individuals, uh, in tumors from individuals from these different uh, ancestral populations. So again, uh, being among the first to uh, uh, really look at this in, in depth at the tumor biology and relationship to uh, genetic ancestry. And our data, again, would suggest that these African-American patients may have tumors with features associated with favorable outcomes. So if they get the, the, the right therapies, they actually may have uh, better outcomes. But again, we have not addressed the issues related to incidence and uh, are hoping to do so through uh, uh, genome-wide association studies uh, in tumors from African-American patients uh, uh, using our whole exome data from COMPASS uh, or uh, performing high-density high SNP array uh, um, uh, experiments and GWAS analysis to see if we can identify genetic variants that might be uh, associated with this increase in, in incidence in myeloma. So hopefully, you know, this, you know, this, this uh, review uh, period has sort of walked you through, you know, some, some aspects of how ancestry can either influence disease risk uh, or, or outcomes, and it could be race or ancestry. Two examples where access is cl clearly driving the disparities, uh, where there's a diffuse B-cell lymphoma, multiple myeloma, uh, and then one uh, example where I think uh, uh, ancestry and biology actually is driving outcome disparity in ALL, but you can uh, eliminate that disparity by making sure kids get a very specific treatment regimen uh, uh, as part of their clinical uh, management. Uh, so now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the work we've done in precision uh, uh, medicine, precision, precision oncology. Again, there's a lot I can talk about. We've, we've, we've uh, run a number of clinical trials, a, a melanoma stand-up to cancer study with Jeff and uh, studying glioblastoma with Prados and the group, Mike Prados and the group at UCSF, and, or the study in triple negative breast cancer we've done with Joyce O'Shaughnessy at Baylor. But again, yet again, I really want to focus on how population and tumor uh, heterogeneity uh, uh, can influence uh, our interpretation of data uh, related to precision medicine. And, you know, this slide just showing, you know, the fact that, you know, targeted therapeutics are, therapeutics are here to stay. And uh, the more we understand about the genomic landscape of tumors, uh, we can provide novel targets to uh, drug developers uh, who can then de uh, uh, develop drugs that specifically, uh, that hit specific, very specific uh, genomic alterations uh, in these tumors. And I think one of the things that, you know, really is awesome is the fact that these drugs don't have to be, you know, indicated for a single uh, disease type. We know uh, imatinib uh, works both in BCR-able uh, uh, um, uh, positive uh, CML, as well as KIT and PDGFR mutated uh, GIST. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've seen activity with EGFR inhibitors, both in non-small cell lung cancer and colon cancer. And uh, more recently, we've seen uh, the development 
of PARP inhibitors and, and, uh, and, and work that we did with uh, Roshanine and Ken Pienta showing that BRCA2 homozygous deletions occur um, at frequencies higher than we would have once thought in, in castration-resistant prostate cancer, and these tumors respond to PARP inhibitors. And it was a fast-track uh, expedited um, uh, approval of, of olaparib for the treatment of a uh, subset of castration-resistant prostate cancers. Uh, and then, you know, I, I'd, I'd be remiss to not say that this, this new sort of, uh, it's really not new, but a newly adopted uh, uh, approach of uh, Im immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, treatment modality and, and targets like PD-1 uh, or PD-L1 uh, on the tumors, PD-1 or CTCLA4. Uh, in the uh, uh, T cells and, and the incredible outcomes that we're seeing with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. Doesn't work for everybody, but in those tumors where it does work and we have some biomarkers where it might work, uh, like hypermutation, expression of these biomarkers or, or the expression of, of neoantigens. So this growing laundry list of, of, of genomic alterations and targeted uh, therapies has led us to this new revolution uh, uh, of, of, of precision medicine and where we can profile a tumor, identify the appropriate alterations, and then perhaps select uh, uh, a targeted therapy for that patient's cancer. These events, of course, are these genes are, are mutated by various <laughs> mechanisms. Uh, we know the oncogenes in many cases can be amplified or mutated or overexpressed, uh, tumor suppressors deleted, uh, mutated, or hypermethylated, and we also know that some of these genes are altered by um, uh, breakpoints, translocations, leading to the, uh, um, the generation of oncogenic uh, fusions that can also be uh, targeted. So, you know, through collaborations, uh, a lot of folks at TGen, uh, and in partnership primarily with my good friend and colleague David Craig, uh, just, you know, I mean, God, I can't say enough awesome things about David and uh, the work that he's done to help build this out. But building out this algorithm, uh, and this was, and I have to give credit to, you know, the Stand Up to Cancer team that helped us derive this and submit a, a uh, exemption for a device to the FDA in support of our uh, uh, Jeff's uh, Stand Up to Cancer study. But, you know, starting with patient and doc and consent and uh, biopsy collection and of specimens and sending those specimens through uh, 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 quality assessment of the analytes and sequencing and bioinformatics analysis, and then uh, essentially merging the somatic information to the drug space, uh, and then generating these reports, holding molecular tumor boards to uh, vet that information, and then provide what we feel is the most appropriate therapy uh, uh, for that patient based on uh, the, 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 the molecular uh, uh, profile. Uh, part of this was building out a, an incredibly standardized and validated platform, uh, uh, part of which was the creation of a controlled access clinical portal. And again, uh, this is David Craig, uh, my just a tremendous friend and colleague, uh, it, where each patient can, you know, a, a clinical research nurse can go in and create a new patient, pr uh, uh, fill out the, a form uh, with, with uh, 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 con with a controlled lexicon and vocabulary, standardized clinical annotations, and then from this be able to generate, auto-generate a report that can be used as part of the molecular tumor boards and the sequencing. I don't get any money from Illumina, but I have their machine here. just want to uh, 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 make sure that that's, uh, that's said. And then we have, uh, again, David's team building out just incredible bioinformatics framework to support um, all of everything from data collection, data management, data analysis, secondary analysis, generation and annotation of the information, creating the reports that can then be vetted by the tumor board, uh, and, and uh, uh, an incredible establishment of a relationship with Dell Computing, uh, a lot of work, hard work that Jeff did uh, that has supplied us with an incredible uh, uh, high-performance computing environment to support this work. And, uh, and then, you know, the process of, of comparing each patient's somatic tumor profile to a, a relational database developed by Jeff Kiefer and, and more recently Sarah Byron uh, and using a, a heuristic programs and, and, and uh, uh, algorithms to uh, match the, the mutation profile with the uh, drug gene relation uh, database and we can sort of modify the or tune the pharmacopoeia however we want based on the study to generate reports that will have the drug, um, uh, other information like is there a, an oral 
formulation for the drug, sometimes it's really important, uh, the alteration driving that relationship, is it a positive or negative indication, and whether or not there are clinical trials available. We built a CLIA lab, fully validate, validated, uh, so it's CLIA uh, certified, CAP accredited. I have to give um, uh, credit to Janine Labello and, and Lisa Bombard Reardon, who were the uh, lab directors, Mary Ellen Ahern, who was the lab manager who helped us build this, uh, this clinical laboratory. And, so, and Jeff and, and Pat uh, had to submit this document to the FDA in support of their clinical trial. And I have a picture of their faces before and after this process. And I think there were a number of babies born, some divorces, and, and a few people quit um, after that, this document was submitted. But um, boy, the, the, the overall um, uh, benefits of having this in place have been tremendous for us because you know, we feel like we're thought leaders in this space and being able to validate a platform such that it meets the, uh, the rigorous um, and stringent guidelines for CLIA, CAP, and the FDA. A uh, number of papers have been published uh, on, on, on methodologies as well as uh, the results of some of these trials, the triple negative breast cancer study being the first and uh, was the uh, most cited paper in molecular cancer therapeutics in 2014. Amazing study uh, led by uh, Sarah Byron. Uh, with Mike Prados and glioblastoma. Uh, even on the pediatric side, work with Lenny Sender at, the, at Children's Hospital Orange County, uh, led by my postdoc, Troy McEachran, who's recently promoted um, uh, to, to uh, end of end, uh, assist, assistant professor. Uh, and I'm going to talk a, lo a lot about the studies we've done in cholangiocarcinoma and, of course, the work that Jeff and Pat are, are leading in, uh, in uh, uh, looking at uh, B non-V, BRAF V600E mutated uh, melanomas. And even some, uh, some papers related to uh, methods and, uh, for validation. Uh, we just had this in Nature Reviews uh, and just sort of reviewing the translation of RNA sequencing into the clinic. Um, we have this paper uh, where we have a set of synthetic oligos that mimic oncogenic fusions that can be used, spiked into a sample in a clinical lab and used to validate the detection of oncogenic fusions uh, from RNA-seq data. And then just a week or two ago, this came out uh, in collaboration with Illumina as well as uh, Marco Mara's group uh, at, uh, in Vancouver, where we have a, a normal tumor cell line pair, Colo 829, uh, where we've all sequenced this uh, in a clinical laboratory setting and actually developed a set of truth variants that can be used or compared to in, in any clinical laboratory uh, to, to put this uh, uh, cell line pair forward as a somatic reference standard for clinical sequencing. And uh, so now moving on to population heterogeneity, uh, I think one of the issues we face in, in precision medicine today uh, is the fact that, you know, in many cases we want to just be able to use a tumor sample because it, it, in, in using this method, we, we, you know, we really don't interfere with the clinical standards and approaches in pathology labs, right? We're not asking them to give us a piece of fresh tissue and sort of uh, alter their their day-to-day -day, um, uh, 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 workflows. Uh, and, but some feel that requesting a sample and some feel that requesting a sample um, for constitutional DNA is not always feasible and compl complicates or, or slows the testing. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, there may be high risk of false positives, and this is kind of where I want to focus this talk. Uh, uh, several, and, and this is very important, I think, from the, pop, from the population standpoint, as some populations have higher genetic variation, so much, like, much more likely to have private variants in their genome. Uh, and those private variants can sometimes trigger drug rules. Uh, and we've seen it many times, and just some examples, and I'm not going to name labs, I'm just going to say Lab E, Lab A and Lab B, uh, this lab doing somatic analysis on the same tumor or the same DNA that was uh, used for tumor-only analysis, uh, where this lab had normal tumor, knew or, or was able to uh, state specifically that that was a really a germline BRCA mutation. And looking at the variants of undetermined significance on this list, uh, almost 10 to 12 of these variants actually were germline variants. They were, had nothing to do with, uh, these were not tumor-acquired somatic mutations. <clears throat> another case, colorectal cancer, same situation. Uh, another patient with uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer where uh, our lab detected a, a frame shift mutation in PIK3R1, which is therapeutically actionable, happened to be missed by the other lab. We won't go into that very much. But there were two other uh, mutations on the front page of that report. Um, one of which triggered a drug rule, uh, and interestingly, we were able to show, because we did normal tumor pair, that that actually was a germ, those two were germline variants. Uh, 
Um, one of these uh, genes, Notch, uh, even though it didn't trigger drug rule here, later could have, uh, would have which would have been the use of uh, gamma secretase inhibitors, for which the one of the the uh, um, uh, uh, side effects is incredible. Uh, diarrhea, diarrhea. And so we want to make sure that we're doing this appropriately and that individuals, again, from populations that have higher degrees of genetic variation, where data may not necessarily be in the public databases for filtering, uh, uh, can have uh, more, um, uh, more of these uh, false positives on their reports. And so it's work done by Rebecca Halpern and, and, and David's lab and, and Zarco in my lab. And we took a series of patients, and we had African Americans, European Americans, and uh, performed uh, principal components analysis and looked at the number of mutations uh, 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 that would have been uh, um, uh, sort of from a tumor-only analysis if you just use filtering using publicly ava available SNP data, uh, showing that you would have had a much higher number of false positives and individuals who have higher degrees of African ancestry versus individuals of, of European ancestry. And looking at the number of, tumor, of, of mutations, again, uh, uh, the average being 242 here versus 125, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and then looking at European versus African American. This is uh, tables uh, not right. But essentially, what we're, what we're seeing here is that if you were African American, there'd be an average of 240 variants uh, uh, on average. Uh, uh, versus 125 if you were European American, and uh, two and a half or three would have triggered a drug rule in an African American versus 1.5 uh, of those false positive drug rule triggering variants would have been on your report uh, if, uh, in, in the case of European Americans. So again, and this is a statistically significant difference. So there's definitely an ancestral bias to this, and we've been playing around with optimizing approaches using probabilistic uh, um, uh, 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 approaches. And essentially what we've done is we've sequenced a series of tumors really deep, done some dilution series, and came to the conclusion that if you have more normal contaminating stroma in the specimen, you can use the germline variants because they, whether it's tumor or germline, germline variants should have an, a, an allele frequency of about 50-50 in a pileup if it's a heterozygous variant. But if it's a tumor variant and there's normal contaminating stroma, those heterozygous somatic variants will have an allele shift. And you can use that information to reduce the number of false positives. And if you sequence higher, meaning if, the, if you have a really high uh, quality sample that's like 90% tumor, you have to sequence upwards of 1,600 to 3,200x to be able to identify these, these allele shifts. And so we've been able, we've played, uh, David and, and Rebecca and, and the team have essentially came up with some algorithms where if this was a triple negative breast cancer from a Ghana African patient, these, the, you know, you have, you know, almost 350 false positives if you use filtering only. Uh, but if you use our approach, you can significantly s decrease the number of false positives that would end up on an approach. And here Ghana and African, uh, European American uh, uh, e, uh, uh, triple negatives and African American triple negatives uh, and a patient with glioblastoma that had Latino um, uh, uh, ancestry. So I'm going to use the final few minutes of my presentation to talk about tumor heterogeneity and its, its impact on precision medicine. I think many of us in cancer have followed the work of Charlie Swanton and the group over uh, uh, at Cambridge and in the UK, the Sanger Center, uh, where they took a sample uh, uh, from a, a, a kidney cancer patient and chopped it up into various pieces and then looked at the regional profile of each of these specimens. And they also had a, a, a chest wall metastasis that they looked at as well. They were able to show that one of those specific regions, um, region R4, which was this region, uh, had, had mutations that were also available in the METs, but none of the other lesions from that tumor did, suggesting that this tumor sort of sat in the middle between the primary and the METs. And so they were able to draw these phylogenetic trees. Just amazing work that uh, showed at the gene expression uh, a level. R4 also mimicked the, the METs more uh, than any of the other uh, uh, from the primary renal lesion. And so we've worked out some algorithms. So this is one of our compass multiple myeloma patients. Uh, and Jonathan Keats has built out uh, 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 bioinformatics tools that will allow us to look at clonal variants uh, in the tumor. So in this particular patient, we picked up three different clones. This is looking at the uh, 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 sort of the, the bimodal or trimodal distribution of heterozygous variants, which uh, indicate various uh, 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 subclones. And so in this particular patient, looking at time point one and time point two, the distribution of these clones is pretty similar, meaning uh, uh, this clone remain the dominant clone throughout the, the course of this patient's uh, 
uh, uh, clinical management. Yet another patient, you see very significant clonal dynamics occurring, where at, at, uh, at diagnosis you have this red and blue, uh, these red and blue clones that are the primary, and this low level, low line uh, green clone uh, at, at was also low at, at this time point, but became among the dominant clones, and the blue clone goes away over various courses of treatment. So this tumor heterogeneity and this shifting and flowing of various clones under various uh, therapeutic um, uh, conditions is gonna provide us with information on understanding uh, uh, what mechanisms are associated with response or resistance to the various um, uh, 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 therapies. And then finally, work we've done in cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer, tumors of the bile duct. Uh, they can uh, occur sporadically or be associated with liver fluke. Uh, infection. We're primarily focusing on the sporadics, uh, and it can be very difficult to treat. And we published this paper with uh, Alan Bryce and Matesh Borat at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, um, uh, where we uh, showed uh, the in integrated genomic characterization uh, and clinical sequencing identified therapeutically actionable context around FGFR and EGFR pathways and treatment. Uh, one patient with an e ERRFI1 homozygous deletion. ERRFI1 is a very obscure, obscure gene, was not on many of the cancer panels that people were using in clinical laboratories. Um, but it's, it's critically important because its role is to prevent dimerization of, of, of herb receptors. So, I mean, it can be among the, has to be one of the most important tumor suppressors. But understanding this patient had loss, hypothesizing that um, it, was, it was leading to hyperactivation of the herb, uh, 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 herb signaling, EGFR signaling, tumor before erlotinib, tumor after erlotinib. This is uh, looking at metabolic activity, just a dramatic response um, uh, because we selected erlotinib because of a, uh, the uh, uh, hypothesis of, of EGFR activation. We also identified tumors that had FGFR2 oncogenic fusions and translocations, uh, treating those patients with FGFR inhibitors, looking at densitometric scans before uh, uh, planatinib, which is a, a select uh, uh, FGFR inhibitor and tumor after, tumors just melting away in these patients. Um, so moving forward and, and, and thinking more about the concept of heterogeneity in a different context, patient comes in with, uh, with uh, advanced uh, cholangiocarcinoma, sample sent for clinical sequencing. Looking at the copy number data, we saw this uh, event on chromosome 8, which <coughs> was characterized um, uh, as, as leading to an oncogenic fusion include that, that encompassed NRG1. NRG1 happens to be the ligand for uh, herb receptors leading to increased phosphorylation activation. Again, more evidence that in this tumor type, there's a context around activated uh, uh, herb receptor signaling, and herb fusions have been seen in other tumors, not specifically this one, but what they showed was that uh, these fusions leaded to activation of, of HER2 and HER3, um, we also identified yet another ERFI1 uh, inactivating event in this, uh, in this tumor. So we had activation of the herb receptor pathway on both sides, both activation, hyperactivation through NRG and, uh, and, uh, and loss of, of, of MIG-6 ERFI1. Uh, the discussion of the tumor board focusing around herb receptor signaling, not wanting to target any of, any of the specific receptors, but thinking about targeting multiple receptors by um, using a drug that would prevent uh, dimerization, that drug being pertuzumab. Uh, this is liver cancer before, liver cancer after. Just an incredible response uh, to this, but it was a transient response. Uh, there was a, a, a progression uh, after several uh, months on, on therapy. We were actually able to collect a, a, a biopsy at progression. And looking at the copy number, the eight event went away and this blazing amplification of EGFR pops up that wasn't there in the initial tumor, right? So treat with pertuzumab, we get rid of the NRG1 clone. This new clone has arisen that has this incredible amplification of EGFR. Um, significant response to erlotinib, but again, uh, it was transient and now we get a third biopsy, right? So what happens next, right? You've been on pertuzumab, had a response. You then go on erlotinib, have a response. Cancer comes back. So what happens? Brrr, right? Is this going to change? I think I ran out of, will this work? Oh, uh, oh, uh, acknowledgments. <laughs> What did I do? You guys get to see my talk backwards to forwards. Okay, here we go. One more. Can you do one more? <laughs> 
No, I don't. One more. Go forward. It should. I am. So I've like pressed it like 80 times <laughs> in both directions. <laughs> Don't press the button. <laughs> ah, guess what happens? The first clone comes back. So you've got this clonal ties. So Pertuzumab kills this clone. Uh, Erlotinib kills this clone. But the, the, the first clone came back. But what happens in clinical oncology? at progression. You never give the, the pre, a previous treatment because in the oncologist's mind, the patient has failed that treatment, right? And so we have to take these aspects of, of tumor heterogeneity in, I, I can't get this move, uh, in, into context of precision medicine. Uh, and I think it's complicating our ability to see improved outcomes using, you know, this incredible uh, clinical approach. So in summary, um, population and tumor heterogeneity in genome science and precision oncology, oncology exists. There is race and an ancestry, and they can be related but are not necessarily the same. I think I've shown that. Uh, there may be an enrichment of certain biological factors uh, that can be associated with biology and phenotypes and outcomes. Um, uh, research into uncovering these factors will help us better understand uh, disease etiology within various populations and could provide information on how to better, how to best approach clinical, man clinical management. Uh, development of tools and methodologies can help to improve the performance of precision medicine, uh, um, uh, which can have critical impact on clinical interpretation uh, results. And I think I've shown that, particularly in ancestral pop populations that have not undergone significant bottlenecks where there are lots of genetic variants. And tumor heterogeneity, of course, exists uh, and uh, is, is, is a confounder in current clin uh, precision medicine approaches, and better tools and methods will allow us uh, to better sample the entirety of a patient's cancer instead of taking snapshots of individual biologies uh, to uncover these clonal uh, uh, aspects of these tumors uh, that are primed to, to, to induce relapse. So in conclusion, one more. Can I go? Should I touch the button? Uh, who cares? Um, acknowledgements. Um, boy, this thing was full of people's names. Um, uh, <laughs> it was all me. Uh, <laughs> but you know, just you know, specifically, of course, David Craig and and all the work that he's done. He's been an incredible uh, uh, collaborator and partner in a lot of this work, uh, Jonathan Keats and Willie, Winnie Liang, and uh, developing a lot of our sequencing infrastructure there at TGen. Uh, can't, can't say enough about the support that Jeff has given me through, through the career to have the freedom to approach these high-risk um, uh, studies that have, I believe, uh, allowed me to apply you know, knowledge and science and genomics to improve clinical care for patients. Um, and then our clinical partners, Matesh and Allen at, at uh, Mayo Clinic, Pat LaRusso, uh, at Yale, uh, Dan Von Hoff and, and the group at Scottsdale Health, who Dan has been sort of the godfather of precision medicine at TGen, and then all of the funding agencies, MMRF, the Pro uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation, Komen for the Cure, uh, the Ben and Catherine Ivy Foundation, uh, the NIH, and the NCI. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> There's a couple of quick questions. If there are any, I'd love to engage the audience. Thomas. Thomas. This uh, new, new actually, NRG1, uh, mm -hmm. this gene actually localizes at the site of a common copy number variant. Uh -huh. And uh, mm -hmm. we and others have shown that these are sites where the chromosome breaks and this is correlated to either translocations or sites of copy number changes if you do CGH. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I know, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, you know, a really interesting observation that we've made in triple negative breast cancer. I, I don't want to give it away yet because I think it's going to be seminal. Um, but we've seen breakpoints in a very specific region of the genome encompassing a very important tumor suppressor, only in tumors from African American women so far. Uh, and, 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 and my hypothesis is that there's some genetic haplotype or some uh, 
some ge that's, that's more frequent in individuals of African ancestry that's leading to these breakpoints occurring at that very specific region of the genome. So, you know, as part of our ongoing studies, our hope is to better understand that, to be able to, you know, utilize publicly available data like the data you guys are generating to look at where these breakpoints are occurring uh, and to understand more about the genetic contribution and haplotypes and how they relate to specific alterations occurring in specific somatic, uh, um, uh, specific somatic events occurring at specific regions of the genome. I think that it's been a lost um, opportunity uh, in the cancer genome space that there really hasn't been enough integration between the germline community and the somatic community to really understand how the germline influences somatic alterations in cancer. Uh, and I think that that could be one of the more um, uh, uh, exciting opportunities for us going forward in understanding uh, cancer initiation uh, and progression and outcomes in different, in different groups of people. Uh, maybe I can ask some questions. So sure. for the multiple myeloma story, you mentioned African Americans, they actually have a good uh, favorable prognosis signature, but their prognosis, uh, um, you know, um, is actually worse. Uh, so have you looked at the treatment, you know, they have yeah. received? Well, what that's is the correlation. That's the amazing thing about the COMPASS study is that it's longitudinal and we know treatment up front and we know treatment yeah, along exactly, the patient's exactly. uh, clinical management. So we don't yet have that information, but we will by the end of the study because we'll have arguably the only data set that will allow us to do that that's powered enough to make those correlations to be able to say, if you have these events and you're f you have favorable outcome, but you didn't get, yeah. you know, these three specific regimens, you're likely to do worse and you're likely to do better. So we'll be able to make those correlations because of the, d the design of that study. Okay. If no further questions, I'd just like to thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, there will be a reception you know, right now in the NH library, and as a token of uh, Appreciation, we're going to give this to John. It's a, you know, aerial photo of an age, and uh, you're welcome to sign this um, around, you know, the, the frames. You know, this will be in the library, you know. At Where's the building nine? That's Where's what I'm going to building nine? It's for. somewhere right There's here. history in the basement of building it, it nine. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go take a picture of it before they tear it yeah. down. Yep, Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank